Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today I'm going to try to upgrade my Amiga 1200 with this. This is my Amiga 1200 that, uh, as you can probably tell, already is heavily upgraded. We have a mechanical keyboard and there's a Blizzard 1230 Mark IV uh, 68030 accelerator card in there with, I think, 32 megabytes of RAM. There's an Indivision AGA card in there, which uh, provides HDMI output or DVI in this case, but basically the same. There's a CF card, hard disk in here, all kinds of belts and whistles. And the most obvious thing is that it's in one of these uh, translucent A1200.net cases. Today I want to take this a step further even, putting a terrible fire 1260 68060 accelerator card in here, which should provide 128 megabytes of RAM. This is the terrible fire 1260 accelerator and expansion card, which I bought from amigastore.eu, which I think is one of the recommended sellers for these. Uh, these are quite expensive. I bought a version without a CPU on there because that was less expensive. And as we're going to see, I have uh, CPUs that I can try with this. This was designed by Stephen Leary, also known as Terrible Fire and uh, he made the Terrible Fire range of cards, uh, basically, which are mostly open source. This got open sourced as well recently, so you can build your own if you dare. I didn't. Some of the cards are kind of discontinued, so you have to make them yourself or find a place that still sells them, but they are not going to be updated by Steven himself. This one still is going to get updates, as Steven said, for the foreseeable future, but only if there's uh, like bugs that are found in the software or in the firmware in this case. So let's open this up and see what we got. Oh yeah, I nearly forgot I ordered this. This is a real-time clock, battery buffered clock, because the Terrible Fire 1260 doesn't have one on board and my Blizzard that is in here currently has a battery buffered clock. We have some installation guide leaflets that I'm not going to read. I'm going to read them, of course. And we have the card and even an installation disk. So this is the card. Here's the RAM. Here's where the processor goes. Some, I think, level shifting stuff. And uh, all the control logic is in these programmable CPLDs. I'm going to populate this with a 68060 and see if it actually works. Let me quickly tell you the story how I got into possession of uh, two 68060 full-fledged Revision 6 processors. Around a year ago, I got contacted by Christian, who is a viewer of my channel, and he asked me if 68060 processors were kind of sought after in the retro community and they were useful for anything. And I uh, instantly replied, that yes, they are, and they are reaching pretty good prices on eBay, to put it mildly, these days, even last year. I think the prices have probably doubled in the meantime. They're just insane. So I would never be able to afford an accelerator card with a proper 68060 in there if it wasn't uh, for Christian donating them in the end. So uh, I answered his question and he asked me back if I wanted some and I said, yes, indeed, of course. Uh, <laughs> so he sent me two, actually, two full-fledged 68060 processors that were pulled from an interesting device. So Christian told me that the 68060s, two of which he sent me, he actually got 20 of them or something like that. They were all going to be discarded and he saved them from the trash basically. And they came from these Cognex uh, 900, I think, are what they are. These are PC cards for machine-based vision. So basically, uh, they are the computer's eyes. 
and they are used for industrial applications like as it says here in this ad they are actually for sale here uh, sorting pharmaceutical tablets by color they can basically grade colors and tell the machine which color something has so they are used for production lines for like fault finding color faults and things like that i guess christian managed to uh, save 20 of these cards from the trash and remove the processes from the from them and save them thankfully that's how i got two of those they were going to go into the trash so if you work someplace where these cards are used it's a good idea to have a look at them because these processors are super sought after and super expensive these days and uh, of course thank you so much for donating two of them to me christian uh, we're going to see if they work but these cards seem to have worked until they were going to be trashed so yeah the chances are they're going to work and here they are Ta-da! They look pretty beat up and I think there was probably some kind of heatsink attached to them at some point. Maybe there's some things that look a bit like glue residue. But the pins actually look superb. No bent pins or anything. So should be good to go if they work internally. I'm wearing my ESD safe wrist strap by the way. And this is ESD foam and uh, my tabletop here is also grounded so hopefully we're not risking damaging them so this one is an xc68060 rc 50a from the year is the first numbers after this in the second row on this side 97 this was made in 97 so it's the older one of the two still a fully uh, fledged 68060 there's also versions that have an ec or an lc in here that are lacking the FPU and or the MMU. So th these are way less expensive than these. These are a couple of hundred dollars at the moment. So that's super cool to have those. And the other one is uh, an even newer one from 98, which is also an MC68060 RC50. And uh, yeah, they changed the XC to the MC at some point in the production run. These numbers on top here in the first row of these uh, printings here, they indicate which mask is actually in there, the mask of the die they put in here. And this seems to be one with uh, these, both of these seem to be revision 6, 68060, so they are probably overclockable quite a bit. I'm probably not going to need that or even try that because they run a lot hotter if you overclock them and I really don't want to risk damaging these or the Amiga. Maybe I'm going to try it for a short time, but I'm not going to do anything uh, spectacular. These are going to be plenty fast for my Amiga. This seems to be an 89 model even, 99. So it uses, I think, the last incarnation of the production process, which uses uh, the smallest pitch on the mask. So this is probably the best chip of the two, or the better one. Production of these continued until sometime in the early 2000s. It's not really clear when production definitely stopped. Support for these by Motorola who made these was stopped in 2015, I believe. There's a very good website uh, that helps you spot fakes. Of course, there's a lot of fakes and also tells you a bit about the history of these chips and the different revisions and things like that. I'm going to link that in the video description. Uh, it helped me to identify that these are actually genuine chips, uh, especially since they came from an industrial used piece of equipment so uh, these probably are genuine and they are and they were probably never overclocked or anything like that in that kind of environment it's pretty important that things just work so uh, chances are these work still and are in good condition funnily enough uh, christian also sent me an amd k62 chip which is like an uh, a pentium compatible chip mostly i used to have a pc that ran a k62 chip later revisions of these cognex cards actually used the k62 as the processor and replaced these 68060 with that that's pretty interesting just wanted to point that out so probably going to try to clean these up a bit and then put one in here i really can't believe i have these these are like unobtainium basically so I'm using some isopropanol 
carefully wiping them. But I think most of the stuff we can see on there are actual scratches, probably from these cards just being put into a trash container. They seem to be pretty scratched. I think I'm going to go with the version without the A because that's the later one. So let's put it on there, I guess. And pin one should be this corner where it's uh, flat. You can also see that there's a pin missing here and there's a pin missing here. That should be the way this tucks in. There's also sockets that only have these uh, pins populated there. You should carefully place this in here. Make sure all the pins find their home. Yep. Whew. Okay, that was step one. <laughs> so the other one I'm going to stash away. In order to put this card in the Amiga, it is recommended that you open up the Amiga because it's not going to be easy to insert this with uh, this newly produced connector here. And also maybe I'm going to have to do some timing fixes on the Amiga. So the card supposedly goes into this expansion slot under the trapdoor, but it's pretty huge even compared to my 1230 card that is in there and that barely fits. <laughs> uh, these new cases have these ventilation holes in this cover, which probably makes sense for an accelerator card. I never ran into any issues with the Blizzard card that's in here. It actually says 16 megabytes, so I only had 60 megabytes all along, which is plenty for an Amiga. Yeah, this card has really served me well, but it's got to go. So I am going to remove all these screws. So all the screws removed, quite a few on these. And now this just lifts up. I'm removing the keyboard. Interestingly, the 1230 card has the processor facing out of the case and this is supposedly going in here like so. So it has the processor facing upwards. Yeah, Blizzard 1230 Mark IV. We're going to remove that and put the other one in. And now time to get the Blizzard out. Yep. And now this part is maybe a bit more demanding because, yeah, as I said, this is a new connector on this card. So we have to get it perfectly straight. Maybe we have to remove this screw. Probably a good idea just to be able to angle the board a bit more. So we have this perfectly straight. I'm actually shaking. Because all this stuff costs a lot of money, including the A1200, obviously. Okay, that wasn't too bad. I think I'm in. I'm not going to try to pull on the processor. i wiggle my way in. Ah, that wasn't too bad. We're in. And now you got this all the way in. It's recommended that you pull it out half a millimeter or something. It's in. One thing that I need to work around is uh, that I still have the original 3.0 kickstart ROMs in here that this machine came with, actually. We're going to replace these with something that I'm going to talk about in a bit. The downside to having 3.0 ROMs is that the RAM on the Terrible Fire card is not going to be recognized. So we're not going to have uh, 128 megs of RAM extra with the 3.0 ROMs. No way around that. You need at least 3.1 to make the Amiga recognize the RAM. Another thing, there's an IDE header on here, but that needs some trickery to make it bootable. It should work if we use it as a secondary drive, but I want to make that bootable because it's allegedly much faster than the rather shoddy IDE on board here on the Amiga. We're going to use that for now and see if my Workbench 3.1 installation that's on here, I think, still boots up at all with this card. Usually you need some extra libraries and things to recognize the 68060, but it might just boot. The plan is obviously to make 
The new CF card, that's why you've seen the new CF card in the background, probably, in the long run. But I kind of am curious to see if this powers on at all and boots. And you might need a powerful uh, power supply. I'm using one of the uh, 4.5 amps ones that Commodore provided with some of the later model Amiga 500s, I believe. That usually is enough oomph. But you might want to use a another power supply from somewhere else or make your own. Okay, fingers crossed. Let's see what it does, what it says. There was some screen flicker. The drive is ticking. Do we get any kind of picture output? No. Oh, it's flickering. What's going on? It's rebooting, maybe? We get a guru meditation. <laughs> okay, so we probably need something else. But the guru tells me that this card actually powers on. It has to use some kind of processor for that. <laughs> By the way, this should uh, auto-configure to be clocked to 50 megahertz, which these processes are designed for. So no overclocking going on there. Yeah, let me see if I can go into the boot menu by holding down both mouse buttons on startup. Yep, that works. Yay, 68060 boot menu. <laughs> So, okay, it's just a problem with my installation. Let's try to boot up something else, like the Amiga test kit. Yay! 68060 revision 6. Nice. Yeah, it doesn't detect the memory, as I've said, with the old Kickstart ROM. So it just has the 2 megabytes chip RAM that are on board. Yeah, but it's recognizing the 68060. That's good. So, and I've also managed to boot up sysinfo from disk, actually. And it also says we have a 68060, which we have with an FPU and with an MMU. So it's really a full 68060. Do we dare take the speed test? <laughs> Let's try. Without any extra RAM and things like that, no uh, modifications. <laughs> okay, uh, that is definitely not correct. The speed can't be quite right uh, like that. There's a few things I have to do in order to make this work properly, I guess. I'm going to perform a whole new install and I also want to upgrade this to Kickstart 3.2.1 while I'm at it and to uh, the workbench 3.2.1. First step is going to be to put some 3.2.1 custom Kickstart ROMs in here that I had a really hard time making. I had some help, a uh, shout out to Elle and Okona in my Discord. Thanks for your help. I managed to make some, I have no idea if they work. I'm probably going to end up doing a separate video about the whole process because I did so much tinkering in a Linux shell that I don't exactly remember how I ended up uh, getting there. But I'm going to try to recreate the process and I'm going to make a separate video in case I can remember all the steps necessary. I'm going to link the script that I ended up using in the video description and also there's a very good video on how to make custom Kickstart ROMs, including among other things, the drivers for the onboard IDE on the TF1260. And uh, I think the TF1230 also requires drivers for the IDE to boot. CRG, who has a very good YouTube channel anyway, so I recommend subscribing to that channel anyway, uh, has made a video a little while back on how to pull that off using actual Amiga hardware and software. I'm going to do a separate video about using the script because I thought it would be easy, but it wasn't. <laughs> for me, because I'm a noob. So here's my mask ROMs that are in here that are 3.0. And actually, this is the low and this is the high ROM. I'm going to replace those after removing them. There we go, okay. So while I'm here, I'm spraying some contact cleaner in here. Let's put my custom ROMs in. And you have to take care because these sockets are actually for 42 pin EPROMs or ROMs. And you have to leave two pins free on this side. And obviously 
the low one goes in the high position. <laughs> Top one. And the high one goes into the bottom. So that's my nicely labeled, no idea if they work, ROMs in there. Let's see if it boots up. So I think what I want to do is to just remove my IDE card here altogether in the hopes that this is going to boot up. Also going to remove the disk. Uh, this is going to boot up to the kickstart screen. These ROMs have the IDE drivers for the terrible fire on there. They also have the workbench library and the icon library and things like that that were missing from the ROMs from 3.2 and 3.2.1 on there and some other belts and whistles. Yeah, custom ROMs. These are 512k chips. Originally the kickstart ROM is only 512k total. So these are technically a one megabyte kickstart ROM, which the A1200 should support without any extra hardware. Let's see, fingers crossed. Come on, please work. It ticks. <gasps> the drive is ticking. Oh. Whew, I'm so relieved. And it says it's the 3.2 ROM, but version 47.102, which is the 3.2.1 ROM. In fact, yay, I made working kickstart ROMs. Well, this info looks a whole lot more appropriate now too with the new ROMs. Let's see if we get the whole 128 megs of RAM. Yep, it works. Neat. This is of course without any drivers installed except for the ones that are in my custom ROMs already, which are quite a few actually. I can't remember which exact drivers are in there, but yeah, ah, I'm so relieved. <laughs> yeah, so after I got that part of the equation working, that's mostly all the hardware stuff, I have yet to see if I have to make a timing fix uh, to the board uh, in case this runs unstable in some sort of way. We are going to have to remove some capacitors. Uh, I'm going to link a description of that procedure in the video description as well in case you have to do that. Some Amiga 1200s have some capacitors populated and some resistors that were there for, I think, EMI stuff, but they're not needed in any way for anything. And they are kind of messing up the clock signals a bit, which prevents some accelerator cards from working properly. I'm not sure if this one has those populated at all. I read some figures about 1 to 2% of Amiga 1200s having those populated. Chances are yours hasn't got them, but there are some Amigas that have them and on some of them it can mess up the accelerator cards. So I'm going to link that information in the video description and we're going to figure out if this runs stable. So installing Workbench 3.2.1 on this. So I just tried to hook up my CF card adapter with the original 3.1 installation and it seems to try to boot from that, which is a good sign actually, but we run into the same software failure that we saw before with this installation. So I'm definitely going to have to make a new installation of the workbench. But this onboard IDE seems to work with my custom kickstart ROMs and it seems to boot. I got myself a SanDisk Xtreme 3 8 GB compact flash card in the hopes that this works for the purpose. And I'm going to install Workbench 3.2.1 on that, or rather 3.2 and then run the update. I'm going to use an external GoTag for the purpose and uh, just use the boot menu to make this the first boot device, uh, so we can boot off this and not from the internal floppy. I think I'm just going to go through the whole installation process without uh, showing you any of the details. I did videos about this process before. I don't think it's necessary to go through all of that again. The first issue I encountered is not a pleasant one. And that is that the IDE connector on the Terrible Firecard actually didn't recognize my CF card adapter. 
I think it's, it might be incompatible. Uh, I have switched to the internal header, IDE header now, and it recognizes the adapter fine. So I'm going to do the installation on that one and then possibly switch the CF adapter to the other card or try and source another CF adapter that might be more compatible. I'm not sure. Maybe that's just because uh, there's no special drivers on this install disk that I booted from. It wasn't recognized at all, so we had nothing in this list in HD toolbox. But now we should actually be able to go through the whole configuration. Yep, that worked fine. So we're installing the CPU libraries now. I'm going to use the ones provided with the 3.2 installation at first. So we should just run the installer again. That's what it said, I think. So install CPU support libraries. Yes, MMU libs. I have other. And yeah, we are installing the libraries necessary for these uh, accelerator cards, basically. These are the general ones. I think there are some better ones on the installation disk that got provided with the TF1260. But MMU libs is super important. The other stuff is going to make the system work better as well. So I'm going through all of this. Uh, to activate these libraries, you must reboot your machine. And now we should boot into the hard disk, ideally, or the CF card, rather. Or maybe we're booting into a black screen. No. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have our workbench here. I think I want to run the 3.2.1 update at first. The update is complete. Select proceed to reboot your Amiga. Okay. And now it should boot into Workbench 3.2.1. It does boot from the internal IDE, but I, when I stick my CF card adapter into the TF1260, it throws me an error like a guru meditation. Probably my CF adapter is not quite up for the task. It tries to boot and the EH IDE should be on my ROMs, unfortunately. As you can see, it doesn't quite work. So I'm sticking with the internal adapter for now, I guess, the internal header, until I figure that out. Hmm. It is a couple of days later and I did some more tinkering with this and I installed some of my usual tools on here and things like that. And I also went through the web page tf1260.com, which John Hertel uh, set up to have like a walkthrough of things you need to do to make this accelerator card run appropriately. Uh, amongst other things, I installed the Terrible Fire tools that were provided there and I also installed the latest version of the MMU lips that you can get from Aminet that is linked on that website, which I am going to link in the video description. And now uh, I have this all running quite nicely, I think, with my Workbench 3.2.1 installed and all the drivers I need with the card and the tools that are needed to uh, access the special functions like overclocking and things like that on this card. It seems to run super stable. We get a bit faster speeds now. And also I managed to get the EH IDE running. That means the uh, IDE port on the Terrible Fire card that is actually quite a bit faster than the internal IDE port on the Amiga. For some reason it didn't work during installation of the workbench. I think I might just have plugged in my adapter board in the wrong way or something like that. I'm not sure. Now it works, it boots off it, so the drivers, the IDE drivers are definitely in my kickstart ROM. If you don't want to make a custom ROM, you can uh, use the load module command and load the 
EH IDE drivers during startup. So you could potentially put a secondary IDE adapter into the internal IDE port on the Amiga, boot from that, have the driver loaded with the load module command, and then it is going to restart automatically if you load that in your startup sequence and boot from the IDE port on the terrible fire card, which is actually quite a bit faster. Uh, let me show you the speeds I get now. This is with the terrible fire card without any overclocking run, running at 50 megahertz, which is the standard setting. And as you can see, we get 37,560 dry stones. I've seen some people getting better results. I'm not sure if my configuration is correct. And uh, yeah, at this speed, it is not getting warm at all, basically. At least the CPU isn't really getting significantly warm. So we don't need a heatsink. If you want to overclock this, which is possible in theory, especially with these Revision 6 chips, you can potentially overclock them to slightly above 100 megahertz even, but you are going to need cooling because they are going to run hot pretty quickly. And I'm not sure if I want to risk this super expensive chip doing that because as I said, there's not a lot of room in the A1200 to put a heatsink on that chip. Uh, it's located directly under the keyboard assembly and uh, there's very little room for a heatsink, let alone a fan. I know there's probably workarounds for that and people posted pictures online of uh, like cut heat sinks. They cut the heat sink at an angle and have a fan blowing over it. So it might be possible. It's just not really for me because uh, yeah, the chip is super expensive and I'm not going to risk that. I'm going to show you the drive speed quickly for DH0, which is my uh, CF card running through a simple uh, CF IDE adapter on the terrible fire card. And as you can see, we get 6 million thereabout bytes per second, which is significantly faster than the uh, internal IDE. I think the internal is around 3 or 4 on a good day. So that is quite the improvement. As I said, everything seems to work fine. We don't get any crashes or any random behavior that's not appropriate. You can see that all our expansion memory is now recognized with all the appropriate drivers and my kickstart in there. Uh, as I said, with kickstart 3.0, you are not going to have access to the expansion RAM, which is a pity. So uh, I recommend upgrading to kickstart 3.1 at least. So what can we do with all this power now? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if this speed is necessary in an Amiga 1200. Uh, usually for the normal user, like a 68030 card of some description is super sufficient. Uh, this is kind of overkill. But I, I felt like I had to try this. So we can now, we can now do uh, things like run actual Doom on this and things like that at decent speeds. Uh, as you can see here, this is a Doom, like an old version of that. And it runs pretty smoothly, actually. There's probably a lot of optimization that we can do with Doom, but uh, this is just a, like a, the basic install of Doom. Didn't do any tinkering with it yet. Uh, but the frame rate is pretty decent, so it's absolutely playable. Of course, this is also, I think, the AGA version. So we have 256 colors, like on a PC with the VGA card. Uh, this is just using the AGA chipset in the Amiga. There's also other versions that use graphics card that you can put in here. I think there's also a version that uses the Indie Vision that I have in here, and that would provide better frame rate even, I guess. Just wanted to quickly show you this. This is now totally possible. I absolutely think this runs about as well as on my first PC. And actually, I think for many people, Doom was one of the reasons to make the switch to from the Amiga to the PC. Uh, it certainly was for me. And now I can play it on my Amiga, which is kind of satisfying. <laughs>
Yeah, I'm sorry, not paying attention here. Well, there's more. There's also this, something named Amiquake, which I'm going to start up here. And that is actually a port of Quake, believe it or not. And that runs pretty decently too. I think uh, it would run more decently if you would overclock the CPU. This doesn't have the best frame rate, but it's totally possible to play Quake on this thing now. <laughs> Which is kind of an amazing fact and it's, yeah, you can see it's, it's pretty stuttery. So we would have to overclock the CPU. This is uh, basically not really made for this. But uh, yeah, it, it runs and that is quite remarkable. Amiquake. As with uh, Doom, this doesn't include any optimizations or anything like that. It's just the basic installation, which probably could be optimized in many, many ways. And also there's other versions of this that I haven't tried yet. I'm just using the basic install of Amiquake here. Where are you? <laughs> yeah. That totally works, and yeah, it's just a native Amiga thing, so we can quit it and get back to Workbench, <laughs> which is pretty nice. I'm pretty happy with that, and uh, of course there's so many different options you can try, and uh, like software that runs a lot faster, like professional software, Deluxe Paint is going to fly, and things like that, and uh, other software that you would use to actually like ray tracing software that stuff exists for Amigas and that is going to run so much faster on a 68060 if the software is optimized. That is a huge downside to having a 68060 in here. It's not that compatible with a lot of older Amiga software because the 68060 processor came out basically at the end of the life of the Amiga, when the Amigas were discontinued in the late 90s, uh, the 68060 was at its peak. So not much older software is optimized for the processor and some of it doesn't run as smoothly as it could or should with the processor of that power. Unfortunately, so I especially noticed in some WHD load games and things like that, that they are not really running as smoothly as on my previous Blizzard uh, 1230. So the 68030 is way more compatible with things. So if you just want a gaming setup, this is definitely not for you because I got uh, slowdowns in WHD load games. I had uh, graphics glitches and things like that in WHD load games. There may be some ways to tinker with the uh, options and things like that to make that less obvious, but I tried for some games and it didn't really get uh, satisfying results for some of them. Most of them do work fine, don't get me wrong, but it's definitely less compatible than uh, having the stock 68020 that is on board here in the A1200 or a 68030 accelerator card. So I would recommend, based on my very limited experience with accelerator cards, uh, to get a 68030 accelerator card if you want the super gaming A1200. And that's plenty fast enough for everything you want to do, unless you want to do professional work. Apart from that, this card, which is open source, open hardware, is an amazing feat and it is super fast. So uh, kind of like the fastest you can get with like old school components. I know there's other options these days like the Pi Storm, which is a lot faster even than this and probably more compatible because it uh, emulates 68020 and 68030 processors just at higher speeds. So maybe that is a better option for more compatibility. This, however, is the old school way of uh, boosting your Amiga 1200 and I'm super into that. So yeah, 
I'm a fan. Thank you again, Stephen Leary, for putting all that work in there and everybody else involved. There was a whole group of people from the community being involved in optimizing this. Some things I noticed, uh, the CPLDs on the card run pretty warm and many of the cards you can buy pre-made have little heat sinks on the CPLDs, which is something that I am going to add definitely because those run way warmer than the actual processor in my configuration running at 50 megahertz, that is. Uh, another thing I want to do is probably update the firmware that is on here because Amiga Store EU sold me one that has the firmware with the number, revision number 999 on it. And there is an upgraded firmware which allows for more overclocking and things like that. I think in the newer firmware, the processor is going to run a bit warmer, but a bit faster. That might be the reason why I saw different values in SysInfo for my speed. I think the newer firmware uh, accesses the processor a bit faster. So some optimizations took place. I am probably going to update that. I don't have the necessary programming adapter yet. And uh, yeah, that's going to be for another video. Also for another video, as I mentioned, is going to be the uh, custom kickstart ROM tinkering as soon as I figured out how I did that, my ROMs seemed to work as expected. So I did something right in the end. But as I said, I'm only going to make a video once I have the process completely down. So that might take a while. I'm going to try that again and see if I can make these again, basically. I think I want to put my real-time clock that I also bought in here now. That should just be plug and play, basically. And I also want to stick my old CF card in here and copy everything across. And I'm using this nice CF adapter. I got this from Retro Passion CA, which is a recommended shop for Amiga and Commodore in general accessories. I might be able to fit this in here. That would be great, actually. And pin one goes there. So that might just fit into the terrible fire card so we can use that adapter. Let's see if we can fit the keyboard with this buffered adapter which is way nicer than my unbuffered one. Yeah, that might just work. That would be nice. So I'm going to put the clock in there which goes on the clock port which uh, the name suggests that that is made for having a clock in there. And this is just a little PCB that has a battery holder that a battery plugs into that is also provided a CR1220 3 volt battery, like so. And now we have a standard clock chip on here that should provide a real-time clock. And this just plugs onto the clock port header. That should be the clock installed. Now we should have our real-time clock functionality back. Our CF adapter works. What time is it? Let's see if the keyboard still fits. There's a jumper on here, like this uh, little thing that has a, a handle kind of thing. You could replace that with a smaller jumper, like a regular one. And I think we have to do that. I'm just going to replace that with a regular one, I guess. I think I have a little stash of jumpers here. Oh, very low profile one. Yeah, that should do. Yeah, and then I'm going to use my old CF adapter to back up the rest of my old CF card. And then we're good to go. Unfortunately, one thing that is probably worth mentioning, I think you don't get the LED for the hard disk to light up if you're using the IDE port on the Terrible Fire card. But that is a minor flaw. Let's see if it, if it keeps the time now. That was one of the purposes here. Time. Yup, kept the time. Nice. So my clock works, my Terrible Fire card works. Excellent. Yeah, I'm in the process of copying all my old files across into new folders on the new CF card, which has plenty of room because it's uh, eight gigabytes, my old 
full thing was uh, four gigabytes. I'm going to th sort through this without you watching, I guess. It's not that interesting. Obviously, I'm going to put this back together, put the keyboard back in and close the whole case and then uh, do some more tinkering with it. Maybe there's going to be another video about this whole setup eventually as soon as I figure new stuff out. I'm just at the beginning of the journey, so to say. So hopefully you found this video enjoyable and informative. Thank you so much for watching. Special thanks to all my supporters on Patreon and on the YouTube channel memberships page and on Ko-fi. And also thanks to everybody who still designs new hardware or software for the old systems that we all love still. Keep the Amiga alive. Hope to see you again on this channel sometime. Thanks for watching. I'm Jan Beta. See you next time. Bye.